Welcome to this episode of the Voice of Victory podcast, recorded live at the campus of Victory Baptist Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. We hope the message today from Pastor Chris Nolan is a blessing to you. Before you begin listening, I invite you to grab your Bible and follow along. Now, let's join Amen. Pastor Chris. Praise the Lord. I sure hope he's your cornerstone this morning. Amen. I hope you know him as your Savior and your Lord and that he is the cornerstone of your life. What an awesome song. Christ alone, cornerstone. If you take your Bibles with me this morning, turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We continue our study here in the book of Philippians. And we're looking this morning at verses 12 through 18, where we're going to talk about the joy of living. The joy of living. First, uh, Philippians chapter 2. And verses 12 through 18, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke, In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Let us pray. Father God, you are our creator, you are our sustainer, and Lord, you love us with a love that is beyond anything that we can ever imagine. You sent your only son, Jesus, to this earth to die on that old rugged cross and to pay the price of sin for us. Three days later, he victoriously rose again, conquering death, hell, and the grave, and today, We have victory in Jesus because of what you have done for us. You are our cornerstone, the foundation of our lives. Everything that we are, everything that we do is built upon you. May that be true of us today. And Father, as we open up your word and we learn from you this morning, we pray that you would remove every distraction from our lives. May we see your word, may we understand your word, and may we apply your word to our lives, and we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name, amen. You know, last Sunday, we talked about how we are to work out our salvation, and we mentioned that working out our salvation does not mean we work for our salvation, because salvation is not by works, it is only by the grace of of God, but we talked about how that when Paul said we're to work out our salvation, he's referring to our progressive sanctification, growing to become more and more like him. And the Bible teaches us in the book of Romans that you and I, as believers in Christ, we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. One day, we will be made to be just like him. But in the meantime, we have a lot of growing to do. Uh, None of us have arrived. The Apostle Paul realized that when he said that he had not apprehended. He has not arrived. He still had work to do. He still had some, some spiritual growth that he needed in his life. And we all need that. We need to exercise. We need to work out our faith, work out our salvation. And last week, if you recall, we talked about some of the spiritual disciplines or exercises that we needed to do, things that we needed in our lives, in our our daily and regular spiritual exercise routine. Those things were Bible study, prayer, meditation, scripture memorization, worship, church attendance, and witnessing. All these things are things that you and I can do to work out our salvation, to work out our faith. And as we work out our faith, God will do a work in us so that he can do a work through us. 
And so when we practice these basic spiritual disciplines, it will change the way that we live. It will change the way we live amongst ourselves and our lives will have a great impact on the world that is around us. Warren Wearsby said this, he said that God is more interested in the workman than in the work. If the workman is what he ought to be, then the work will be what it ought to be. You see, I'm afraid that so oftentimes as a church, we get caught up in the work. We get caught up in the routine. We get caught up in all the things that we do, but we forget about the heart. Because you see, God is not necessarily concerned with the things that we do, but he's concerned about our heart. He's not as concerned about our doing, he is more concerned about our being. He's concerned about who we are, he's concerned about how we live, he's concerned about how we conduct ourselves amongst ourselves as a body of Christ, he's concerned about our attitude. You see, it is living from the inside out. It is living with the right heart. It is letting God's power flow through us that will bring us a joy for living that is beyond anything that we can imagine. This morning, I want to share with you some of the ways that we are to live as God works in us. You see, if we are exercising our faith, if we are practicing those spiritual disciplines, together as a church, as we grow in the joy together, then what's going to happen? It's going to change our conduct. It's going to change how we relate to one another. It's going to change how we live amongst ourselves. Keep in mind that Paul is writing here in the context of the local church. He's encouraging the local church and how they are to live amongst themselves. And there is great joy when we learn to live amongst ourselves in a way that honors the Lord. Notice some of the things that we see here this morning as to how we are to live amongst ourselves. The first thing is we are to live without complaining. Live without complaining. Notice what he says there in verse number 14. He says to do all things without murmurings, to do all things without murmurings. You see, the principle here is that when it comes to life in the church, then we are not to be complainers, amen? You see, when there is a spirit of murmuring in the church, then you cannot expect God to move amongst us. If we want to see people getting saved, If we want to see people baptized each and every Sunday, if we want to see disciples made, if we want to see people being equipped for ministry and sent out on mission, if we want to see the church grow, if we want to see revival break out here at Victory Baptist Church, then we must guard ourselves against a spirit of murmuring and complaining, which could very well be the downfall of the church. Amen? If we want to see God move amongst us, then we have got to learn to live without complaining. You know, when I've been in ministry now for nearly 25 years, and of course, during that course of time, I have heard some of the silliest complaints, y'all, than you could ever imagine. I mean, you could only imagine. Uh, I remember one time there was this church business meeting where where this lady stood up and she had a complaint. And her complaint was that we was baptizing too many people because it was costing the church too much money to pay for the water to fill up the baptistry. Now, can you imagine? Doesn't that sound silly? You know, it's kind of like Jeff Foxworthy. You know, here's your sign. You know, I mean, what, what, what's wrong with you? Uh, and there was one place where I served as a pastor years ago, and uh, there was some people in the church that complained that my sermons was, was too simple and too evangelistic. Uh, They said, preacher, you're always just preaching to lost people. You're always just preaching to, you know, people that need to be saved. I thought about saying, well, hey, maybe maybe you need to be saved, you know. Maybe that's why I keep preaching to the lost people, because maybe you're lost, you know. But uh, they complained about that. But here's the funny thing. In the exact same church, there was a lady that came to me in my office 
threatening to leave the church because she said, Pastor, your sermons are too deep and I don't understand them. And it's sort of like you're sitting in a seminary classroom. And so, uh, you know, you can't win. Amen. You, you just can't win. Uh, no matter what you do, there's going to be somebody that's not going to be happy. You, you can't please everybody. Paul says, hey, you need to live without complaining. There is a, a pastor friend of mine uh, who pastored a church where his office was in the upstairs of the building. And in his office, there was a door that led to the outside. And when you open that door, there's just this little platform there. Remember, it's the upstairs of the building and a ladder that drops down, right? It's kind of a fire escape thing. Well, on that door in his office, he had a big sign that said complaint department. Amen? Think about that. <laughs> Live without complaining, Paul says. You know, one thing that I have learned is that before I complain about something, I need to stop and ask myself, is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? Uh, is it worth the battle? In the whole scheme of things, I, I would encourage you in that. If there's something that, that comes across your mind and you think, well, you know, that just doesn't set with me very well. I just don't really like that. Uh, I, I think I might, might say something about that. I think I might do something about that. Before you say anything, before you do anything, just stop and ask yourself in the whole scheme of things, in the mission of the church, in the purpose of God in this world, uh, in the whole scheme of, of eternity, and reaching people with the gospel and the mission of the church and our purpose and why we are here, ask yourself, is it really worth it? Is it really worth the argument? Is, is it really worth bringing it up? Is it really worth even mentioning? Think about that. Ask yourself, is it really important? Paul says that we are to live without complaining. And if we want to see God do a great work amongst us, then we cannot have a spirit of complaining or murmuring in the church. We're to serve the Lord faithfully through our local church without complaining. And Paul says, hey, do all things without murmuring. And so he says, as you work out your salvation, as you grow together in joy, as you reach the world with the gospel, he says you need to do this without murmuring because if you're complaining amongst yourselves, then what happens? We're distracted from why we are really here. We get distracted from our mission. And so if we're all busy complaining amongst ourselves, then we lose sight of the lost and dying world around us. We lose sight of why the church is here and what our purpose is and what our mission is. And so that's why Paul tells the church at Philippi, he says, in all that you do, as you work out your salvation, do all things without murmurings, without complaining. There's a second thing that Paul tells us as we live our lives together. He says to live without complaining, but he also says to live without arguing. To live without arguing. Notice he says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Paul in these verses is dealing with our attitude. He's saying don't have a complaining attitude and don't have a argumentative attitude. Have you ever been around somebody that, that they're, just, they're just argumentative? They argue about everything. <laughs> you know, no matter what it is, uh, they're going to disagree with you. It doesn't matter what you say. They're always going to say the opposite. You know, it doesn't matter what you say. They're, they're always going to have an argument. They're always, you know, looking for a fight. They're always looking for something that's wrong. They're always looking for an argument. My friend, that kind of attitude has no place in the house of God. You know, there's nothing wrong with bringing up a legitimate concern. And we need to do that. We need to, to bring our concerns. We need to, to talk about things. But we should not be argumentative people, amen? Uh, there's nothing wrong with sitting down and having a serious conversation. But the problem is, is when our attitude is in such a way that we're constantly looking for a fight, that we're constantly looking for an argument. And so we need to be very careful about that. How is it that we avoid disputes within the church? Well, we avoid disputes by focusing on our mission and on our purpose and learning to love and to trust one another. You know, one thing that I have found in the years of ministry 
is that sometimes there's a lot of mistrust in the church. You know, the, 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 pa- the pastors and the staffs, they don't trust the congregation, and the congregation don't trust the pastors, and nobody trusts the, the deacons or, or, or whatever it may be, and oftentimes there's this mistrust, and everybody is, is on guard, and it's like walking on eggshells because, you know, you, you know, no matter where you turn, you feel like just a, an argument or a fight is going to break out because nobody trusts anybody. Let me tell you something. Let's just remind ourselves of something this morning. We are the family of God, amen? We are brothers and sisters. We ought to be able to trust each other. We ought to be able to love each other. Uh, we ought to be be able to be honest with each other. We ought to learn to to forgive one another and have a trusting environment amongst ourselves. And so therefore, Paul says, look, you need to get along. You need to trust each other. Stop complaining. Stop arguing. But stay focused on why you're here and learn to love one another. Why? Because we are family. Amen. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. The key is having a clear vision and staying focused on that vision. When we lose sight of why we are here, that's when arguments happen. When we get focused on things that really don't matter, rather than on the vision and what God has called us to be and to do, that's when things begin to fall apart. And so he says we need to live without arguing. As a church, Paul says we must do all things without murmuring and disputing. There's a third thing that Paul tells us to do, not only to live without murmuring and disputing, but he also says, notice in verse 15, that you may be blameless. We are to live blamelessly. Verse 15, he says, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights. This verse is tied in to what Paul was saying in verse number 14 where he tells us that we need to be careful how we live amongst ourselves as a church. Why? Because there is a lost and dying world that is watching us. He says you need to be blameless so that you can shine as lights in the midst of a perverse nation. The Holman Bible commentary says that believers are to be so distinct from unbelievers that we stand out as positive models. If God is working in our lives, we are to be unlike the godless society around us. We are to make them curious as to why we are not like them. Christ himself said that we are to be the light of the world. Why is Paul encouraging the church to live in such a way? Why is he telling them not to be complainers? Why is he telling them not to argue amongst themselves? Why is he telling them to be blameless? Why? Because there is a lost and dying world that is watching our every move. They are curious about this thing called the church. They are curious about the people of God, and they are watching everything that we do. So therefore, we need to live a blameless life. Paul says that we are to live without rebuke, without rebuke. In other other words, we are to live in such a way that we cannot be accused of wrongdoing. We are to live above reproach. This is why I believe that as believers in Christ, we need to have a high standard of living. You see, the problem is in the life of the church today is that our standards, we seem to, to, to use the world as the measure of our standard of conduct. But here's the problem. The standards of the world is constantly dropping, lowering, and we see that in society today. The problem is that over the years, that as the standard of the world has slowly declined, the standard of the church has slowly declined. And we we have this idea that as long as we're just one step above the world, then we're okay, then then we're good. 
But I'm here to tell you this morning that there is a standard that has never changed, amen? And it's the word of the living God. This book has never changed. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what was wrong back then is still wrong today, amen? And what was right back then is still right today. And so therefore, the standards of for Christians and how we should live and how we live in the world and how we live amongst ourselves, the holy lives that we live should never, ever change. Why? Because this is our standard. Don't compare yourself to the world, amen? Don't, don't say, well, I'm, I, I'm a holy person because I'm not doing this or I'm not doing that or I'm not like the world is today. Let me tell you something. The world today is far different than the world in years past. The standards of the world today has continued down a downward spiral of depravity. Don't compare yourself to the world. Compare yourself to this book, amen? This is to be the standard. That is why as Christians, we need to have certain standards in our lives. We need to have standards about the way we dress. We need to have standards about the places we go, the people we hang out with, the substances that we put into our bodies. You know, by the way, there's some Christians that will say, well, pastor, I don't think there's anything wrong with drinking um, alcohol. I have a good Alabama word for that, hogwash. The Bible is very clear about that matter. You say, wait a minute, preacher, Jesus drunk alcohol. Jesus drunk wine. Well, we can get into a big debate over what that meant and what the wine was then compared to the wine today. But here's the thing. In our world, in our society today, the issue is not necessarily the alcohol. The issue is the testimony. The issue is your appearance. The scripture says to abstain from all appearance of evil. So if it looks like you're doing wrong, then the Bible says don't do it. Amen. Uh, I love what Bear Bryant said, uh, you know, a famous Alabama football coach. He said, when in doubt, punt. Amen. When in doubt, punt. Uh, you know, here's the thing. When you have a doubt, when you have a question about whether or not something is right, then don't do it. Amen. Just stay away from it. And so here's the issue. In our world today, in the United States of America, alcohol is equated with a lot of other evils. When you see people out drinking and all those different things, what happens? Your, your mind goes to, oh, those people are doing this and those people are doing that. It's equated with other evils. Whether the substance is necessarily wrong or not, that's up for debate. But the issue is the appearance. The issue is your testimony. And so if you as a Christian are going out and hanging out with your buddies and drinking alcohol and all those different things and people see you, what's the thing they're thinking? Well, they're thinking not only are you drinking, but you also are involved in all the other evils that goes with it. And so it ruins your testimony. Paul says that we're to live blamelessly. That means we're to live perfect. That means we're to live in such a way that nobody can ever accuse us of doing something that is wrong. We need to live in such a way that nobody could ever accuse us of doing something that is evil. Now, there are some things that you may say, well, this thing is not necessarily wrong, just like the whole idea that Paul mentioned about uh, not eating, you know, eating meat that's offered to idols and all those different things. But what did Paul say? He says, I would rather not touch it than to offend someone and cause them to stumble, amen? And so that's why we need to be on guard and we need to be careful about what we do, when we do it, who we're hanging out with, who we associate with, all the things that we do. Why? Because there is a world that is watching our every single move. And we need to be very careful about the things that we do. We should be so blameless. Here's the thing. We should be so blameless that if something goes wrong at work or wherever it may be, that we are the last ones that anyone would ever think to accuse. We need to live such a blameless life. I have a cousin over the years who got blamed for everything, whether he was in the wrong or not. He just, you know, it was, I guess, the reputation. But growing up, uh, he was accused of everything. If something went wrong, then, you know, it was, it was his fault. You know, he, he would get in trouble for it. He would get the blame for it. You know, Paul says as Christians, we're to live blamelessly. 
We're to live in such a way that if something goes wrong, that people don't automatically think that we are the ones that are at fault. So he says to live blameless. And that goes true in every area of our lives. The places we go, the substances we partake in, the the words that we say, the people we hang out with. We need to be constantly on guard. Uh, What we put on Facebook, all those different things all apply to this issue of living a blameless life in the world. Why? Because people are watching us. Paul says that we shine as lights in a perverse nation. And if we're going to shine as lights, then we've got to be blameless and we've got to be without rebuke. That's what Paul tells us to do. He says, do all things without murmurings and disputings that you may be blameless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. There's a fourth thing that we see here that Paul tells us to do to to live out our faith, to, li- to experience the, the joy of living as we grow together in that joy. Not only are we to live without complaining and arguing, and we're to live blameless, but we're also to live in truth. We're to live in truth. Philippians chapter 2, verse 16 says this, Holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul says we are to hold fast to the word of life. In other words, we're to, we're to hold on to the word of God. We're, we're to live obedient to God's word. If the Bible says don't, then we don't. If the Bible says do, then we do. We're, we're to live in obedience to his word. We're to hold fast to the word of God. And by the way, you cannot live obediently to the word of God if you don't know God's word. Amen? That's why that spiritual discipline of Bible study and memorizing Scripture is so important so that you can know the truth. You cannot be obedient to the truth. You cannot live the truth unless you know the truth. And so therefore, you've got to be a student of God's Word so that you can know the truth and then live out that truth, holding fast to the Word of God. And when we do that, we need to understand that as we live out our lives and we live in the truth, that what we do in this life matters. Notice that Paul says, I'm going to hold fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. You know, unfortunately, a lot of Christians think, well, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, and so what I do in this life doesn't really matter because after all, I'm going to glory anyways. Let me tell you something. What you do in this life does have a bearing on how you're going to spend eternity. Because you see, your eternal life is not something that's in the future. Your eternal life began the very moment that you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The very moment that you were born again, you entered into eternal life right then. And the Bible teaches us that one day we will be rewarded or we will have the absence of rewards based on the things that we do as believers in this life. How we live out our life here is going to determine the rewards that we receive in glory and also, I believe, the jobs that we have, the positions that we have, the things that we will do in glory is determined by what we do here and now. How we live life on earth has a bearing on the rewards and the joys that we will experience in glory. And so therefore we need to live in truth. Why? Because Jesus is coming and if we're going to rejoice in the day of Christ, then we need to be men and women of God that are holding fast to the word of life. I don't know about you, but my desire is that one day when we get there, that he will say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, I don't want to get there and have God say, well, you know, you're, you're, you're in. By the blood of Jesus, you're in, but that's it. You have no rewards. You, you have nothing to give. You have nothing to worship me with. You have nothing to, to put back at, the, at my feet. You have no crowns. To give back to me. I mean, can you imagine how devastating that would be? 
To have God say, well, you're in. You're in because of what Jesus did for you, but I have nothing to give you. I have no rewards. I have nothing that you can have to to worship me with. I want God to be pleased with me. I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. After all that he's done for me, I can never do enough for him. Amen? And so, therefore, we need to live in truth. Why? So that we can rejoice in the day of Christ. There's a final thing we see here that Paul gives us. He says that as we live this joy, as we live our lives together as believers, we're to live without complaining, we're to live without arguing, we're to live blameless, we're to live in truth. But then he says we're to live to serve the Lord. We're to live to serve the Lord. Verse 17 and 18, it says, Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering... On the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Now remember, Paul is writing this letter to the Philippian church while he is in prison in Rome. And Paul here seems to be content and accepting of the idea that he may very well become a martyr. And so he says that if he must lose his life, He rejoices that he would lose it for the cause of Christ, and he believed that the church of Philippi would rejoice with him. You see, if you want to have joy in your life, then you need to be involved in kingdom work. Paul said there is no greater joy than to serve him. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says it is joy either way. And Paul says, if I'm going to be offered up as a drink offering, if I am going to have to give my life uh, for the cause of Christ, he says, let it be. He says, I rejoice in that. He says, it is a joy to serve him. It is a joy to be involved in that kingdom work. Don't live for yourself, but live for Jesus. Amen? Don't live for personal gain, but live for the advancement of God's kingdom. Don't live for personal pleasure, but live to worship Jesus. Your whole life should be wrapped up in serving Jesus. You should live to serve. And if you want to have true joy, if you want to have true joy in your life, then stop focusing on yourself And start loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Then and only then will you experience true joy. I've known people over the years that they God has blessed them. They have a lot. Uh, They they they're able to do a lot of different things, but instead of living for the Lord, they live for themselves, and they're selfish, and they live just for them and their own happiness. And yet they are some of the most miserable people that you'll ever meet. They're grumpy. They're always complaining. They're never happy. They never have a smile on their face. Why is that? Because they're living for them rather than living for Jesus. You see, when you're living for Jesus, it's going to put a smile on your face. And by the way, when you're living for Jesus and you're involved in kingdom work, and you're focusing on reaching people with the gospel, and you're focusing on building the church and encouraging one another and helping one another to grow, when you're focusing on those those things, when you're focusing on the kingdom work that God has called us to do, then guess what? You're not going to have time to complain, amen? You're not going to have time to argue. You're not going to have time to, to live worldly and to do those things that can hurt your testimony. Why? Because you're so involved in living for Jesus. I ask you this morning, what is your life all about? Is it about you or is it about him? And church, if we want to see God do a great thing amongst us here at Victory Baptist, then guess what? It can't be about you. It can't be about me. It can't be about Victory Baptist. It's got to be all about Jesus. Amen? And when it's all about Jesus, then there will be no complaints. When it's all about Jesus, there'll be no arguments. When, there's all, when it's all about Jesus, there'll be no disunity. When it's all about Jesus, there'll be no living in sin and impurity and our testimonies being ruined. When it's all 
all about Jesus, God is going to be glorified and people will be drawn to him. Jesus says that if he is lifted up, then all people will be drawn to him. Church, we need to stop lifting up ourselves. We need to stop lifting up our own agendas. We need to stop lifting up our own little pet projects. Instead, we need to start lifting up Jesus. Amen. We need to let Mount Juliet and the world beyond Mount Juliet to know that he is the king. He is the Lord and he is the only way to salvation. And if they don't trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they will spend an eternity separated from him in a devil's hell. Let me tell you something. We need to get back to the place where it's all about him, where it's all about Jesus, because in the end, that's the only thing that's going to matter. Amen. It's all about him. So we need to live to serve the Lord. Your life needs to be wrapped up in serving Jesus. Live to serve. You see, true joy is found in the abundant life given to us by Jesus Christ. I ask you this morning, are you enjoying the life that God has given you? Are you enjoying the life that God has given you? The only way to enjoy life is to live without complaining, to live without arguing, to live blamelessly in the world, to live in the truth and live to serve. Then you will have true joy in your life, amen? And you will experience the joy of living. I encourage you this morning to stand with your head bowed, your eyes closed, and as you begin to pray and meditate on these things, we'll have a time of invitation. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, let me tell you something, there is no greater joy than in having a relationship with Him. There's no greater joy than in knowing that my sins are forgiven and I have an eternal home in heaven waiting for me. If you're here today and you're not 100% sure that you're saved, I encourage you, won't you make it right today before it's eternally too late? Your pastors will be standing here in the front, and you can come where we're standing, and we'll be glad to take a Bible and, or lead you to someone who can take a Bible and show you how you can be saved and how you can know it. The Scripture says that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever means you, and it means me. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad your sin is. It doesn't matter how far your, your life has taken you away from God. Let me tell you something. As long as you're still breathing, there is still hope. Because Jesus loves you. And he is here today with his arms wide open, ready to receive you into his kingdom. If you'll just trust in him by faith. I encourage you to do that this morning before it's too late. Child of God, maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I... I kind of identify with what you've been preaching on this morning because here lately I, I've been a little grumpy. I haven't been very happy. Haven't had a lot of smile about. Well, maybe it's because you're not experiencing the joy of living. You're too wrapped up in yourself and complaining and arguing or, or living like the world rather than living for Jesus. They just want to come and kneel and pray and just recommit your life to the Lord. Say, Lord, would you forgive me? And Lord, would you help me this week to make it all about you rather than about me? The altar is open. You come this morning. If the Holy Spirit convicts you, it deals with you, and you do business with God today, be obedient to him. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And Father, we pray that if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior. Father, we pray that you would convict them God, that you would show them their need for you, open their eyes, soften their hearts, help them to receive you as their Lord and Savior today before it's too late. And child, uh, if God, we pray that as Christians that you would help us to, as your children to, to live blamelessly. Help us to live in truth and without complaining, without arguing amongst ourselves because we are to shine as lights in the world around us and people are watching our every move. So help us to be careful about how we live. Forgive us of our sins and where we have failed you. And Father, when the Holy Spirit convicts us of things, Lord, help us not to ignore it, but help us to get it right so that we can live that blameless life and you can be glorified through us 
And as you do a work in us, that you can also do a work through us. So, Father, we pray that you'll move there in this invitation time, God, that your Holy Spirit would move, and, Lord, that we would be obedient, and we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you've been blessed by this week's message and invite you to join us soon in person on the Victory Campus. Worship schedules and other information can be found on our website at bbcmtj.org. Please visit it today. Have a great day and we'll see you soon.